Hello, everyone, wherever you may be. Uh, it's very uh, nice that you're uh, joining us this afternoon. Uh, my name is Rodney Hero. I'm the uh, director of the Center for Latinos and American Politics Research at Arizona State University. Uh, we're very pleased and thrilled, actually, to have uh, a, our speaker today, who is Juliet Hooker. Juliet is a professor of political science at Brown University. She's a political theorist who specializes in racial justice, multiculturalism, Latin American political thought, and Black political thought. She's authored two books previously and is now currently working on one. Her second book, entitled Theorizing Race in the Americas, Douglas, Sarmiento, Du Bois, and Vasconcelos, received two major awards from the American Political Science Association, including the Ralph Bunch Award, which is considered the premier uh, award for work on uh, uh, race, ethnicity, and so on within the discipline. Uh, what she's going to present to us today comes out of the book uh, on which she is currently working, and uh, she will be providing you the title and so on, but let me just give you the title and, and then we will have the subtitle later. The title of the presentation is The Democratic Politics of Racist Monumental, Monument Re Removal. The Democratic Pol Politics of Racist Monument Removal. And so I'm pleased and proud and honored to uh, introduce Juliet Hooker to make her presentation. And thank everyone for being here. We really appreciate your, your joining us. Juliet. Thank you, Rodney. It's uh, my pleasure to be here with you this afternoon or whatever time it is from wherever you're joining us. Um, I'm delighted to be um, sharing some of my work in progress in this current book, which looks at um, uh, questions of political loss and how they're um, animating contemporary racial politics in the United States. So I'm going to jump right in and i um, going to share my screen very um, briefly with you. Um, and so the title of the talk, as Rodney said, is The Democratic Politics of Racist Monument Removal, Failed Proceduralism Versus Effective Rioting. And the title is intentionally provocative because what I'm trying to think through in this piece is the question of how should we look at these protests that have galvanized removal of racist monuments when it had taken, when those monuments had been standing for hundreds of years in some cases, and the struggles for their removal had ended in stalemate or um, were at an impasse in many cases. So I'm just going to jump right in um, with my talk. In May 2020, in the midst of a global pandemic, the utter disregard for the life of George Floyd by Minneapolis police officers and the subsequent viral video of him pleading for his life and breath for nine minutes and 30 seconds while a white police officer choked him by kneeling on his neck, ultimately killing him, sparked mass protests against racism on an enormous scale not seen since the protests in Ferguson after the killing of Michael Brown in 2015. The movement for Black Lives is called to defund the police, to disinvest in carceral approaches uh, to communities and invest in Black Lives has received renewed attention as a result. And a number of cities have begun to reconsider their budget priorities and to contemplate criminal justice reforms. While it remains to be seen what lasting pol policy changes will be enacted in response to current protests for racial justice, there is one area where the impact of the protest is undeniable. After decades of inertia and stalemate, racist statutes have come down in the US and elsewhere. And I am going to show you now uh, this image, which is from um, uh, monument removal in Britain. Um, since the protest sparked by Floyd's killing and that of Breonna Taylor, numerous Confederate monuments have been removed. Schools and buildings have been renamed and the display of the Confederate battle flag was prohibited or abandoned by many organizations, including the Mississippi legislature, NASCAR, and the US Army. In the United Kingdom, monuments were removed and places renamed that previously honored figures involved in the transatlantic slave trade, British colonialism, and eugenics. And this is a statue of Edward Colson, who was involved in the um, slave trade. In Belgium, monuments of to King Leopold II, who presided over massacres in the Congo, were defaced and removed. 
Since May 2020, when the current round of, um, this is a monument in Richmond of Jefferson Davis that was also toppled by protesters. Since May 2020, when the current round of protests began led by black activists, over 150 racist monuments have been removed in the United States or are slated to be removed, including at least 130 Confederate statues, 27 of which are located in Virginia alone, and also uh, more than two dozen monuments to individuals involved in the genocide of indigenous people, um, including statues to Columbus. These changes are astonishing if one considers that the removal of many of these racist statues seem inconceivable even five months ago. Some of these monuments had been the subject of protracted struggles to remove or contextualize them, involving local city council deliberations, statewide legislation, and extended legal proceedings. Contemporary monument removal has in some cases been legal and official, although often following protest and defacement, but in many cases, removals have been spontaneous or decidedly not officially sanctioned and have involved their liberally breaking laws prohibiting their removals. So one thing we could begin by asking is, why does this matter? Why has the terrain of the symbolic, the public landscape that shapes political imaginations emerged as a crucial site of contemporary debates over racism? The removal of racist monuments will not immediately alter the structural or material inequalities that are an essential element of white supremacy. As the Reverend William Barber, founder of the Moral Mondays protest and president of the North Carolina chapter of the NAACP has argued, for example, dismantling the agenda of white nationals is more important than removing Confederate monuments. He said, if you, pull, if you just pull down the statue, but you do not pull down the statute, the laws that support them, we will still have issues, end quote. So racist monument removal is not the same as toppling the edifice of white supremacy, but neither does it follow that these should be seen as merely symbolic acts that distract from struggles over more important or urgent forms of racial inequality. In the United States, Confederate monuments have become flashpoints in struggles between divergent contemporary racial projects because they are the country's most visible symbolic markers of white supremacy and its dominant form of racist commemoration. One of these racial projects seeks to confront anti-Black racism and remake the body politic on more egalitarian terms. These are protesters. While the other, a white grievance fueled project of racial recalcitrance, seeks a return to eras of clear unquestioned white dominance and Black and non-white subjection. Confederate monuments have thus become important symbolic terrain for both demands for racial justice and white nationalist fantasies of race war. Now, since their inception, African Americans have understood the lessons that Confederate monuments sought to impart, even if they did not internalize them. In Charleston, for example, Black Charlestonian Manny Garvin Fields, who was born in 1888, one year after a monument to John Calhoun was built, interpreted the statue as a message to African Americans about their place in the New South. Quote, I believe white people were talking to us about Jim Crow through that statue, she recalled in 1983. So racist monuments matter because monuments speak. Monuments are prescriptive. The existence and prevalence of racist monuments has important civic effects. Confederate monuments foster a continued possessive investment in whiteness among white citizens, even as they are a material embodiment of white mnemonic privilege and concentration of political power. Whether a political community chooses to let them remain standing, therefore has important consequences on the civic capacities and dispositions of citizens. This is because memorials and monuments serve as mental anchors for political imagination and oppressive memorials shape oppressive imagination. In contrast, contemporary protests reclaim spaces of white supremacy demarcated by Confederate statues as, um, I'm gonna skip ahead to this slide, as spaces 
of black joy. Spontaneous removal and defacement of racist statues, I want to argue, should just be read, should thus be read as radically democratic acts and moments of black agency that integrate the public landscape and seek to transform its meaning. And the transformation of the massive Robert E. Lee the question statue in Richmond is an excellent example of this. In addition to the graffiti that now completely covers the statue, as you can see here, like head to toe contextualization, right? Spontaneous contextualization. Um, we also see that people have reclaimed the space as a space where black people are now welcome. Equally, um, we can see this reclamation of the space in the work of the um, light projection artist Dustin Klein, who has been projecting images and videos of Black citizens killed at the hands of the police, such as George Floyd and Breonna Taylor, as well as of historic Black leaders, such as Frederick Douglass and Harriet Tubman, in a project called Reclaiming the Monument. So protesters then have thus transformed a racist monument, in the case of the Lee statue, into a Black anti-racist memorial however momentarily. In making this claim, I follow Catherine Height's distinction between monuments and memorials. And she offers the following um, uh, definition. Quote, official commemorations often take the form of monuments, which as distinct from memorials, emphasize a victorious path over mournful contemplative loss or sacrifice. But increasingly today, we are also witnessing all kinds of society-driven efforts in creative tension and negotiation with the state to establish memorials and to memorialize that which both challenges state violence and insists on alternative global imaginaries." End quote. So the Lee Monument was a classic monument, and I argue that its current defaced and appropriated form is actually a memorial. Um, that's trying to do very different work from what the statute was originally intended to perform. It was built during one of the sustained eras of, con one of the most important eras of Confederate monument building, the late 1880s to 1890s, when um, most of the Confederate monuments in this country were built. The second important era of Confederate monument building was the first two decades of the 20th century, 1900 to the 1920s, when states were codifying Jim Crow laws and racial segregation and the Ku Klux Klan was resurgent, and the 1950s and 1960s, when segregationists were trying to counter and forestall the civil rights movement. But the Lee Monument is built during the era uh, when Reconstruction has been overthrown, when lynching is at its um, height, and when um, you have this moment of resurgent white supremacy. So at this time, Confederate monument unveilings were rituals to celebrate and cement the rebirth of white rule in the South. And the grandest of these festivities was the unveiling of the Robert E. Lee Equestrian Statue in Richmond in 1890, seen in this um, photograph, which was attended by approximately 100,000 to 150,000 white Southerners one of whom observed that he, quote, felt, I felt as though I were assisting at a combined funeral and resurrection, end quote. For African Americans who were losing any kind of political influence at the time, they nevertheless contested and opposed the construction of Confederate monuments, including the one of Lee in Richmond. For example, an editorial in the Richmond Planet, which was a newspaper founded in 1882 by former enslaved people in Richmond, um, and which was one of the South's most forceful black voices during this era, its publisher, John Mitchell, prophesied in reference to the fact that blacks had performed much of the physical labor to erect the Lee Monument, quote, the Negro was in the Northern possession for Decoration Day and the Southern Ones and Decoration Day was the holiday that preceded um, uh, Memorial Day, if only to carry buckets of ice water. He put up the Lee Monument, and should the time come, we'll be there to take it down. Uh, this was published in June of 1890. It took more than a century 
But in 2020, Mitchell's prophetic claim is finally coming tr true. So now I want to turn my attention to the issue of how political theorists have talked about um, about the question of monument removal. So the dominant approach to the issue of racist commemoration in political theory has been to focus on procedural questions, on how communities should go about making decisions about what, what um, about removal and on the civic utility of democratic deliberation over racist statues, irrespective of what the state of racist monuments ultimately is. Rather than focusing on the political function of Confederate monuments then, political theorists and philosophers largely focus their inquiries on the kinds of considerations that should guide the process of making decisions about removal and on the potential civic effects of debates about removal rather than on removal itself. So they have considered the question of Confederate monuments and, and largely their inquiries are um, framed around three main concerns. One is how to balance the competing interests of protecting free speech with not doing racist harm. The second is how to protect the interests of defenders of Confederate statues. And the third is focusing on the possible civic effects of decisions to remove the monuments, including the potentially beneficial effects on democracy of public conversations between citizens with opposing views regarding the, appro the appropriate approach to Confederate uh, commemoration. So for the most part, um, they haven't taken an absolutist free, free speech position um, that the removal of Confederate statues will violate the right to free expression of defenders of these monuments. Instead, they've argued that, this is that taking expression seriously means taking into account the harm that these monuments um, do, and also that um, that we should think about the work that they do in terms of racial intimidation and how this might affect decisions about removal. There are some, however, who, instead of removal, um, uh, favor an additive approach, not removing racist monuments, but reframing them by adding uh, others that memorialize anti-racist heroes, which was the approach followed by the um, ANC in South Africa, which left most apartheid era monuments in place, but added numerous statues of Nelson Mandela in particular. So Dan Demetri and Ayume Wingo, for example, argue that there are no rational principles and neat solutions that can resolve the issue of what to do about racist statues. They claim that calls for removal are therefore likely to be self-defeating and that um, something like a Mandela era preservationist policy is best, one which removes the most offensive of the minor racist monuments but which focuses on closing the monumentary gap between peoples and reframing existing monuments, that is, contextualizing them. Andrew Walls, meanwhile, argues that a liberal account of racial justice requires that the state affirm the equal moral worth of all citizens and that this includes rejecting past racist practices and the symbols and cultural expressions associated with them. He also says that the state has a an affirmative duty to ensure that memorialization conveys non-racist lessons and interpretations to citizens. Yet his conclusion on the concrete issue of what to do about Confederate monuments is that no single approach is the correct one because each case raises questions of interpretation and meaning. That is, how racist was the person memorialized? What was the intent of those who built the statue? As well as questions of process, who should decide? Um, like other political theorists and philosophers who don't take a firm position on the question of removal, Fowles' conclusion is nevertheless that debates about what to do about racist monuments can give rise to fruitful democratic dialogue. So approaching the issue of what to do about Confederate monuments from the starting point of liberal proceduralism effectively mandates that the interests of proponents and opponents of removal should receive equal treatment then the question becomes how to fairly accommodate competing interests 
um, of those who oppose and uh, removal and those who um, support it. And often, you know, the, the, the weight of the concern seems to fall on the harm that might come from those who support retaining the monument rather than on those who would be harmed by actually allowing them to remain um, standing. So many of the arguments that no clear universally applicable normative, normative judgment can be achieved above what to do with racist monuments rely on a claim that it's difficult and not impossible to determine with certainty what message these statues are meant to convey. But we look at the, if we look at the intent of those who built the monuments, however, and the areas in which they were built, it is clear that their aim was to carve white dominance onto the landscape of the body politic and into the minds of white and non-white citizens alike. And there also can't be, it, it's not possible to claim that they're mere artifacts of Southern history because that completely overlooks the fact that a majority of the black population of the United States lives in the South. In fact, Confederate monuments were built precisely to erase or supplant black memories of slavery, the Civil War, and Reconstruction. And following the letter of the law also involves the compounding of a historical injustice because it reinforces the authority of agreements made and laws passed by, by, laws passed by all white legislatures at a time when black people had been forcibly removed or continued to be banned from political participation in the South. Why then should an agreement governing the donation of a monument that was reached in the context of segregation and white rule still be enforceable and determine the public landscape of multiracial or black majority cities such as Richmond? So focusing on procedural questions then, um, leaves raises as much a whole set of other problems. And the thing that um, political theorists and philosophers converge on, however, is on this view that there's always going to be salutary effects of having debates about what to do. Whether or not removal is achieved, these democratic dialogues, they argue, are a good thing. But even before protesters began taking down Confederate monuments themselves, it was often the case that when cities or universities decided to take down monuments, they did so through opaque procedures and schedule removal out of the public eye with no official announcement. So there weren't these grand um, deliberative um, uh, um, civic uh, lessons that um, proponents argue there might be. So there weren't these great, um, these public conversations, um, nor was there often um, wide deliberation. Perhaps because dominant liberal frameworks provide such unsatisfactory answers to questions about racist commemoration, political theorists and philosophers pivot instead to the question of the impact of debates about removal in and of itself, irrespective of their actual outcomes. In such account, the focus is on civic dialogue, what it can do, but what they fail to take into account is that they, this liberal procedural approach and this focus on democratic deliberation doesn't offer ways to move past democratic or legislative impact. I'm going to um, uh, illustrate that claim by turning to, spending a little bit of time talking in detail about one such site, um, which is the example of Charlottesville, Virginia. So Charlottesville and Charleston, Charlottesville, Virginia and Charleston, South Carolina, exemplify the protracted stalemates and impasse that followed, have often followed attempts to grapple with Confederate monuments. They're also significant because they're the sites of two of the most well-known deadly moments of white racist violence in recent U.S. history. Um, and they're connected by debates about the place of racist monuments and Confederate statues in particular in the, in the contemporary body politic. The Unite the Right rally in Charlottesville, Virginia in 2017. And these are some images from that rally. 
um, in which a white counter protester was killed was ostensibly aimed at preventing the removal of that city statue of Robert E. Lee. While Dylan Roof visited historical sites associated with the Confederacy and slavery in South Carolina, he posed with the Confederate battle flag, affixed a Confederate States of America license plate to his vehicle and embraced symbols of global white supremacy before massacring nine African-American churchgoers in cold blood in Charleston, South Carolina in June, 2015. And I'm going to not talk about Charleston and their um, struggles over a statue of John Calhoun because we're in the interest of time, but happy to talk about it in Q&A if you're interested. Instead, I'm going to move to talking about Charlottesville. So in March, 2016, the Charlottesville City Council received a petition to remove one of its Confederate statues, the statue of Robert E. Lee. Um, in response, it created a blue ribbon commission on race memorials and public spaces to consider the immediate question of whether the city should remove the statues of Lee and of Stonewall Jackson and rename the park um, in which their houses are named after them. Its broader mandate was to provide the city council with options for telling the full story of Charlottesville history of race and for changing the city's narrative through a public space. Now, the history of the Lee and Jackson monuments leaves no doubt that they were meant to celebrate and entrench white supremacy. The statues on the land for both of the parks were donated to the city um, in the 1910s, and the sculptures were installed in the 1920s, and Aaron with Charlottesville and Virginia were imposing Jim Crow racial segregation and disenfranchising their African-American population. The public events to celebrate the installation of both the Lee and Jackson statues were organized by local chapters of the Confederate, by local Confederate organizations and included parade dances um, and official ceremonies were um, preceded and followed by um, a parade on Main Street, cross burnings, and setting off of explosions in Charlottesville by the Ku Klux Klan. In light of this history and the fact that Charlottesville had not yet found a way to tell the histories of race um, um, in its past, the commission ultimately recommended, among other actions, either removing the Lee and Jackson statues to a different site where they could be contextualized or transforming them in place, in their respective parks, which would also be renamed. In conjunction with this, the, um, the commission also suggested the creation of additional memorials, the Charlottesville enslaved and free black population, and the creation of a park and memorial to one of the historic African-American neighborhoods that had been destroyed by the city under the guise of urban renewal in the 1960s. And the commission's view was that this would allow the city to tell a more um, accurate view of its racial past. Yet despite this thoughtful and bold vision um, put forward by the commission, the public landscape of the city remained largely unaltered. In response to the commission's recommendation in February 2017, the Charlottesville City Council voted to remove Lee's statute, but then a lawsuit opposing the decision which continues to this day, continues to prevent its removal. Subsequently, in June 2017, the City Council voted to rename Lee Park, Emancipation Park, and Jackson Park, Justice Park. The Unite the Right rally in August 2017, opposing removal of the statues and rena the renaming of the park, was followed by a City Council decision to shroud both statues. But in 2018, the city was ordered to remove the shrouds by a court, and in 2019, the court also ruled that the city did not have the authority to remove the statues based on a state law protecting war monuments. As a result, Lee's statue remained in place with no contextualization. So it's against this backdrop that in 2017, an African-American activist petitioned the city to rename, uh, uh, rescind the renaming of Emancipation Park because it didn't really mean anything in the context of an untransformed Lee statue. Um, and it hadn't really become a place for reflection where the city could think about its racial past. And so in July 2018, the city council voted to once again change the names of Emancipation Park, this time to Market Street Park and Justice Park, which was formerly the Stonewall Jackson Park, to Court Square Park. 
so we have right the, these much more um, um, uncontroversial names. Um, in 2020, after protests um, against racial justice again emerged, a different Confederate statue in the city was at last removed by the city council. And in the meantime, the Virginia legislature passed a law in 2020 allowing local municipalities to remove war monuments, which now makes it legal to remove many Confederate statues in the state. But the legal case preventing the removal of the Lee and Jackson monuments in Charlottesville is still before the courts and so they remain in place. So the tortured history of Charlottesville attempt to grapple with its Confederate monuments shows the limits of approaches to monument removal that enshrine, enshrine liberal proceduralism as the ultimate source of democratic legitimacy. They not only fail to grapple with the effects of racist commemoration, they also miss the fact that it is protest perhaps even especially those that lead to defacement or violent spontaneous removal that actually seem to make possible changes in racist commemoration. Procedural perspectives that highlight the need for democratic deliberation situate protests, especially those that become uncivil or violent as normatively suspect. But in fact, it has been black protests, civil and uncivil, that has galvanized and enabled monument removal. And here, I had shown this earlier, but not talked about it. So this was a guide that protesters actually came up with for how to take down a monument. Um, and so what I want to suggest then is that there are some issues at stake, even if we think about protests as effective. As effective as protests have been, there's still an, e an unequal economy of suffering at work in these moments of grassroots democracy. Momentum for removal has come from moments when black suffering is hyper visible. But this is itself a problematic distribution of loss as the removal of statues made of stone should not require sacrifices of blood by black people. Protesters have made this point themselves as amid the graffiti that now covers Lee's statue in Richmond, including curses and demands, four words on the granite base stand out. How much more blood? At the same time, instead of viewing decisions to remove racist monuments in the wake of protests as short-circuiting democratic deliberation and the legitimacy it confers, we should see vandalism and other acts of sp spontaneous removal as forms of black agency that are ultimately more radically democratic and participatory than more traditional forms of political activism. We need to flip the script on approaches to monument removal that avoid focusing on the work that monuments do and that assume that democratic legitimacy is the result of deliberation and following established legal procedures. Instead of viewing the removal of statues with, without extended periods of citizen deliberation and litigation as failures of politics, we should embrace spontaneous toppling of statues as, demo, as a democratic politics of insurgency. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Juliet. Uh, very, very much appreciated. Uh, so people can now submit questions and we will see them on our screen. And I will, uh, Juliet and I will work together to uh, read them out and then to uh, have her uh, answer them. So if you have questions, uh, please uh, put them forth uh, so that we can uh, now see them. Julia, sometimes these things need prompting. So let, let me ask a, a pretty pedestrian question, though. Um, is that, you know, certainly the monuments are, are a very visible form of, of this kind of uh, uh, racism. But, you know, there are the other softer uh, versions, if you will, like the naming of, of uh, military installations. As you know, one of the things that has come up is, you know, Fort Hood and on and on and quite a number of uh, military installations around the country is but particularly in the south that carry those names and you know I, I what one of the things I, I thought was interesting is a lot of people don't realize where these names came from and when they were done so what is your kind of perspective or or outlook Do, you know is how is this different and is it is that different important at all Okay. 
Okay, we have a question. To clarify, has monument removal always been illegal until recently? Has there been a law protecting them? Um, so I'm going to start with that question and then I'll move to your question, Rodney. So in some cases, there, has, there have been laws in place preventing the removal of monuments. And this was precisely because um, uh, legislators wanted to, to prevent the removal of Confederate monuments. So some of those um, were passed. Um, later on in um, pretty, so I think Virginia's law preventing the removal of war memorials, which covers Confederate monuments, was passed early in the 20th century, if I'm not mistaken. Many others were passed later after the 1960s um, when um, Southern legislatures were trying to make sure that the monuments could not be removed. So yes, in many states, there have been laws that prevent um, removal. Um, Randy, about your question um, about naming. So I think there is a whole rate. I mean, one of the things that's interesting or important for us to think about here is that, as you say, monuments are one set of Confederate symbols, but there's actually quite a lot of others, right? So we have, um, you know, the use of the Confederate flag, right, which appears on all sorts of, of, of things. Um, um, as well as, as names. And I think one of the things that you, you've seen is, um, for example, um, that the, the, as you say, particularly egregious in the case of the U.S. Army, which is a very multiracial institution, and many of the bases were, in fact, as, as, as people have now pointed out, named for um, Confederate generals who were actually really quite awful, just in terms of their... Um, uh, their performance as officers, right? So some of them were, were, were really quite terrible, um, not, not the kind of person that you would want to honor um, as, a, as an officer in the, in the army, and so as a military um, officer. But yet they were precisely chosen because of um, you know, the, this, this idea of um, needing to um, preserve white supremacy. And in fact, in, in many cases, it was um, Southern officers, even in Northern bases, who enforced segregation on troops and on um, African Americans in their leisure activity. So there's a very long and tangled history in the case of the, of the Army of how um, racial segregation and, um, you know, the renaming of bases and, and some of these um, attempts to impose white supremacy were carried out through through the the army so that's a really interesting thing to to consider um okay uh, next question here is someone's uh, marie provine said i thought the op-ed in the new york times quote my body is a confederate monument quote was very effective your thoughts are you familiar with that uh, op-ed piece I have not read the op-ed. I, I remember seeing the, um, so I'm, I'm sorry, I can't really answer the question. I remember seeing the, um, the headline, um, but I, uh, I, I, I can't really recall the details. I, I can't really give you a very, um, a very detailed answer. I'm sorry about that. Okay. Okay, uh, next question is, how do you recommend we deal with spaces named after white supremacists, not Confederates, not monuments? Right, so this comes back to that naming issue. And I think one of the things, you know, as I say, I think Confederate monuments are the most visible, but they're not the only ones. And I think um, the other, the larger issue is public commemoration and whom we have chosen to honor. So as we look, and this is not just a U.S. problem, you know, that most of the, the, the vast majority of, um, um, of monuments in the United States are, um, are to white men, actually. There are very few statues of women, and there are very few statues of non-whites and of African Americans. I think, um, 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 you know, we're talking about less, I don't want to quote the exact percentages, definitely less than 5% of the total outdoor sculptures. If you look at the, the list that the, um, the Smithsonian um, uh, keeps of outdoor sculptures in the United States. So part of the problem is that we have not, we have 
uh, public landscape, right, public sculptures that don't represent the actual body politic. Um, and, and so there's that issue. The other issue is that many of those are actually racist as opposed to anti-racist. So one of the things that I would say in terms of this question of naming is that we should think about naming things easier. You don't have to take a statue. You can just rename something. Um, and it seems to me that, that thinking seriously about, um, you know, honoring people whom we think embody the values that we want the citizenry to, to embrace is a good thing to do. So, um, so trying to honor people who were involved in struggles um, for, um, in favor of racial justice and, and other kinds of, of, um, of um, you know, struggles for rights seems to me like a good, um, good thing to do. Okay, uh, thank you. Next question. In Philadelphia, they recontextualized George Washington's home by saving the foundation of the houses where his slaves lived and creating a memorial to those people. While I appreciate the effort, it did not feel to me that it actually put Washington's hypocritical history at the forefront. What are some examples of recontextualized monuments, if any, that you studied that you felt were effective and what made them effective? This is a really good question because I think often um, people do turn to contextualization as um, as a right as a as an answer because they see it as a way of of, of let's say keeping a reminder of the of the existence of, of these monuments, some of which have some sort of artistic value also um, in place. But I think, um, you know, one of the things that the Charlottesville um, Blue Ribbon Commission said is that contextualization needs to be in keeping with the monument itself. So you can't have, for example, in the case of the Lee Monument, this huge equestrian statue and some tiny little plaque, right? That's not going to transform the experience of being there. It's not going to transform um, what is happening. So I think you're, you're, example that you're pointing to is exactly right, right? So it, often we have these additive solutions, right? So um, in Richmond, for example, before the current removals, what you had was um, they had added a statue of Arthur Ashe, and then um, there was a, a recent sculpture by Kahinda Wiley um, that went up, but they had left the others in place. And so I think what we have to think about is if we're thinking about this problem of, of how to um, foster, right, um, anti-racist orientations, I think, as you're suggesting, yes, we need Black memorials, we need to, um, memorials to enslaved people, but we also need um, memorials that grapple directly with racist histories, and those have been much more difficult, I think, um, um, to do, and, 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 you know, of course, Germany with the Holocaust memorials has grappled with this with this issue. So it's both, I think, a question about contextualization and how, when that is effective, and then also a question about what, what does it mean to grapple with, um, directly with, with racist, with our racist um, past. Okay. Um, thank you. Next question. Do you see a connection between city governments taking monuments down and city leaders addressing structural inequities embedded in city policies? That is a very good question. And I, you know, as I, I said during the talk, I think, um, I think there is a danger here. One danger is that, right, so, so taking down the monument, which five months ago seemed unthinkable, now seems possible because it might be a way to forestall doing something else like defunding the police or, you know, um, investing in mental health um, services, investing in, in other kinds of, of, of ways of caring for the community. So I think that the way to think about it is, is it might be the case, and I, I haven't studied this systematically, it may be that the cities that are more willing to consider taking down um, racist monuments are also um, also undergoing taking seriously, you know, questions around um, 
you know, other forms of racial injustice? I don't know. I don't know that we know the answer to that yet. So I think that the thing to watch would be to say, are people only doing the racist monument removal or are they doing other things, right, at the same time? And so is it taking the place of doing other things or is it something that is happening alongside um, other transformations? Okay, good. Uh, another question. <clears throat> this person lives in Reno, Nevada, and there's a monument and a park erected in an area of the old neighborhood of Francis Newlands, who was a white supremacist senator. The family created a deed restrictions and donated the land to the city. The deed yeah. indicated that the land park must be named after him. How much can the city push back against the deed? So far, no response from the descendants of the Newlands. This is exactly the problem. And, and this is why I say that, you know, here, um, when, you, when you focus on, on sort of saying the way to deal with this is, is, is to follow the, you know, the, the letter of the law, you come up against this kind of problem. Many of these monuments um, or um, other spaces were precisely donated um, two cities, and they were explicitly tried to prevent them ever being taken down. And so, it, it you know, in, in many cases, it's taken years of litigation. And, um, and in, in cases where it has happened, often the, the descendants have agreed um, to, um, to those changes. In some cases, the descendants have been in favor, but the cities haven't wanted to. So it, it's a real problem. It's, it's, it's a very serious problem because now you have these cities that say, hey, this doesn't represent who we are that are bound by these agreements that were made by, um, um, in the past. And, and, and the question is, you know, how do courts, um, you know, is that a matter for the courts? What can a city do in that instance? And this is why I'm saying that I think, um, um, you know, It's, you know, it's, it's, it, it creates a situation in which, in which you're at an impasse, you're in this stalemate, essentially. Okay. This next one is uh, as much a comment as a question, but let me read it to you and I, I'd be, uh, be curious to hear your response. It says, those Confederate officers were traitors. They should not be recognized at all, but for their traitor behavior. I think that's, you know, that's, I mean, that's factual, right? They chose to secede, and yet they are honored now um, for, even though they, they fought against the United States. And I think this is part of, you know, the, 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 the work that um, the mythology of the lost cause specifically set out to do, which is to say that there was nothing dishonorable about the South having, um, uh, seceded and that it was not, the Civil War was not about slavery, that slavery was this relatively benign institution, and that we can still honor um, Confederate um, soldiers as, um, as honorable men who deserve respect and deserve to be remembered. That was, that was the ideological project of the Lost Cause, and it was enormously successful. They disseminated it through um, through textbooks, they made sure textbooks in the South did not reflect the true history of the Civil War. They erected monuments all over the country to, um, to Confederate soldiers. And so now, right, even saying that they were traitors seems somehow um, controversial, even though it's simply factually the case. Okay. Okay, this next question is a little bit long, but I think it raises an interesting question. So I'll try and read it slowly so that you and everyone can catch it. It says, this might be outside of the scope of your research, but I am wondering whether or not we might be able to apply some of your thinking to other kinds of monuments and specifically to the ways in which K-12 and university curricula were sometimes redrafted in the mid 20th century as de facto monuments to the same ideologies that underlie the imagined mythos of the Confederacy that underwrote the erection of a physical monument in the 20th century? It's a long question, but I think you're getting, yeah. looks like you're, you're getting the gist of it. Uh, so please, Juliet, tell us your thoughts. I, 
interesting to hear. Yeah, this. so I think this, you know, this this ties in very well to what I was just um, saying in response to the earlier question. I mean, I was when I was when I was writing, you know, I was doing some some um, reading and research on um, to to do some of this writing on Confederate monuments, and and one of the the things that I came across that was really interesting is is, is you know that the the Daughters of the Confederacy, right, one of the, the Confederate organizations, specifically, they would actually scrutinize um, the work of historians and try to get works that they thought were, um, um, you know, were not um, sufficiently following um, their account of the Civil War ban. They tried to get books banned um, from being taught at universities, and of course, many of them in the case that, you know, there was, I was struck by it because I used to work at the University of Texas at Austin. They tried to get a particular, you know, history of the, of the Civil War ban from being taught and at, at UT Austin, um, even though the, it wasn't hardly controversial. So there is, there is a real um, way in which our curricula are exactly the product of this work that the Daughters of the Confederacy did, and even more so than in um, in universities in um, in high schools. So the Southern Poverty Law Center does this great report looking at um, what is taught in high schools about the Civil War and about slavery and the Confederacy, and it's amazing how um, how much variation there is, but how little students are actually taught that is actually true and and so they have a number of recommendations about how we need to actually revamp um, the curriculum of high schools um, in particular to correct this this enormous um, success of the um, um, the daughters of the confederacy in really um, mainstreaming lost cause um, accounts of the civil war Okay, next one, and I'm not sure what law specifically is being referred to, but it, the question is, how has the law the Trump administration passed impacted the struggle for monument removal? Yeah, I'm not sure what, what, law, uh, what law is being referenced. Um, I do know that um, when, um, that, you know, Trump has made a, a number of comments um, against the removal of Confederate monuments, defending um, keeping those monuments in place, and that um, he argued that they were going to create, um, um, what was it, a garden of, of, of national heroes. Um, um, so I, I think, you know, clearly, um, you know, I think we can say we're in a moment where, um, you know, um, from sending in um, right the National Guard to, to protect um, courthouses and other places um, um, I think we saw this in Portland that there's been a, a you know um, a huge amount of concern over monuments that hasn't been shown for actual people including people for example who are suffering from coronavirus and the pandemic and, and other kinds of things so it's what's interesting to me is is, is 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 why people are invested in in Confederate monuments, right? These are this is a war that was fought a long time ago, and so so what is at stake in in wanting to defend them today? Um, but I I don't know um, precisely, um, you know, whether on the ground, for example, if the Justice Department is is trying to prevent uh, monument removal. I know a lot of um, uh, cities and um, and you know, municipalities are trying to pass laws to um, um, criminalize protests, right? So if you are involved in a protest, then you know you can be um, charged with criminal behavior that will create um, a criminal record. And I wouldn't be surprised if some of the same things are are are, are being applied. Um, I mean, it, it had been applied before to people who removed. Um, monuments without legal sanction. Okay. Okay. Uh, we only have a few more minutes, but uh, here's a question that's interesting. Are you at any chance familiar with work of political scientists on monument removal in the 1990s Eastern Europe? 
Can it mm -hmm. add anything to this debate? Yeah, that's very interesting because I think up until now, a lot of the work that had been done was about, for example, right, the the removal of, of Soviet era statues um, in 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 various um, places, and I think a lot of the um, the way in which people have thought about that is is in terms of of you know that an attempt to kind of erase. Um, history and thinking about, you know, what does it mean if you if you have, you know, successive, um, uh, you know, regimes trying to remove, right, um, traces of their predecessors from from the public landscape. And so I think the issue here is a little bit different because um, you know, it's not simply right a question of, of ideological difference, but it's also not, let's say, you know, um, uh, Democrats trying to remove statues put up by Republicans or vice versa, right? So I think we would have to think about um, how it is that that we might think about whether racist monuments are a different category than monuments. Um, in general, and I think here what I'm trying to think about in this category is thinking about what are the what are the civic values that we want monuments to impart, and I would want to say that probably one of those values that we want them to impart is 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 anti-racism rather than racism, and so I I'm trying to think about questions of monument removal. Um, in terms of this question of, of what kinds of political imaginations are they um, fostering among citizens. Um, and, um, and so, you know, those, that's a, a bit of a different way of thinking, I think, about, um, about the, those issues. But yes, that's been a lot of the work that's been done, indeed. Okay. Okay. Uh yeah, this is a rather long question, so please listen carefully again, Juliet and everyone. <laughs> uh, the three approaches to monument removal, that is free speech interests of proponents and opponents and democratic dialogue, seem to annoyingly dance around the subtle nostalgia among some white scholars for a world ruled by white power. This nostalgia is still embedded in most of the social sciences which are creations of American, mostly white supremacist scholars and those who were unwilling to challenge them. How relevant are these musings by American political theorists to the history of dismantling of white supremacist statues through subaltern struggles in formerly colonial societies that did not have to contend with remnants of white socioeconomic, excuse me, white economic and political power, unlike the mm -hmm. cases of the US and South Africa? Now that's a lot to, I don't know if you're able to follow the, uh, there's a lot to chew on there, yeah. but your, your thoughts, your observations to, uh, to the, and if you need me to repeat part of it, I can do that. Yeah, go ahead, please. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's, um, this is a, you know, I think um, a really interesting question um, because I think one of the, the issues that you're, you're, you know, you're getting at here with this question is, is you know, um, how do we think about what are the ways in which um, prior injustice ends up shaping contemporary debates about monument removal, racist monument removal? And that was a little bit about what I was trying to get at when I say that these kind of liberal procedural approaches in some ways compound existing historical injustices because what they are doing is setting up as legitimate these prior agreements that were created and were reached at a time when not everybody was able to participate equally in politics, right? When certain people were excluded because they were a uh, part of a different racial group, um, et cetera. And so I think, um, I think this question of, you know, is, is a particular one for these kind of harem vault democracies um, where you had this form of, um, you know, essentially white political rule, um, and and it created and these, um, you know, and, and um, it created this 
legacy that I think we're still trying to grapple with. It is absolutely the case, you know, that it's not, you know, um, if you look throughout Latin America as well, um, you know, you have some of the similar problems in terms of um, who, who is honored um, and, um, and who is not um, found in the public landscape. So for example, you know, um, there's an interesting um, song by the, um, um, there's a Cuban um, um, uh, uh, hip hop group that has a song that talks about, you know, how we need to take down this monument that's to one of the presidents of Cuba in, um, in the early years after independence um, which of course was under U.S. tutelage, and this president actually um, presided over a massacre of Afro-Cuban um, um, activists who were trying to find to who had formed a black political party that that they the that they felt was threatening, and and there was a massacre of the Partido Independiente de Color. And yet he is, right, so he sits on the avenue of president. And so there's this whole issue, I think, of, you know, how do we grapple with the, those, um, those histories in a way that is, is direct and that doesn't whitewash them, even in societies that, that now, right, see themselves as, as not racist? How do we, how do we confront, right, um, uh, you know these these moments of of racial violence in a way that that um, that is clear. And I think that the the questions around commemoration are different. I think depending on on as you say the different kinds of configurations um, of power um, um, in in different locations. Okay, two uh, two questions, and I, I think you can answer them both fairly quickly. One asks about of uh, the uh, many black men who uh, fought for the Union. Uh, how many how many monuments are there erected to black heroes of the Civil War in the in the in the North? Very few. Um, so the most well known is the Robert. Gould Shaw Memorial, which is actually named after the white officer who led this um, black regiment in Boston. It's, um, and the, the monument includes a figure of, of Shaw, um, the Shaw Monument, but it also includes all of the colored, that's what they were called, troops. So it's a, it's a multiracial monument. Um, and then there is a monument to, um, um, to, so one of the things that happened is that there was a, a monument building, you know, kind of mania in the United States um, after the Civil War. And you get all, a lot of these common soldier monuments, so they're monuments to sort of a generic white soldier, or you get monuments to, to leaders like Lincoln or to Robert E. Lee. But most of the common soldier monuments are all white. There are very few that include black soldiers, even in the north. So there's another one that I know of in the north that includes um, you have um, uh, soldiers who represent um, various branches of the of the um, of the army, the navy, et cetera, et cetera. And um, and in there, one of them I think is is a, is black. So they are present in group monuments, but they're you don't have the kind of single heroic um, um, person monument for black soldiers, generally. Yeah, very, very quickly, you know, the, the, uh, the uh, Shaw, the one you referred to in, mm -hmm. in the North, that was the, uh, the, the movie Glory tells the story of that. Uh, you know, it's really focused on that for, uh, you know, some of you, many people out there may have seen it, but the movie Glory is kind of uh, where you had this uh, white general leading the the, so, the black soldiers. Yeah, I guess this will be the last question. I, uh, I think I know the answer. In general, who paid for Confederate monuments? So most of them were actually donated by the Daughters of the Confederacy. So many of them were donated to cities and they were paid for by funds um, that were collected by Confederate organizations. In some cases, they were paid for, like in the case of Charlottesville, 
Um, this was a, a wealthy donor who had grown up in the area and made a, a, a lot of money um, as a businessman and who came back and donated um, the monument. In many cases, it was, there were campaigns in the case of the, you know, the, the, the Lee statue, there was a whole campaign to raise funds for it that was led by various ex-Confederates, but in, in most of them, um, particularly the ones built in the 20th century, it was the um, Daughters of the Confederacy who donated them from all over the country. Yeah, okay. This, this last is just a clarification. One question that was posed as asked about Trump's passing of legislation and the person followed up, uh, uh, the participant followed up and thank you for doing so. It said, I meant the executive order on protecting American monuments mm -hmm. that apparently Trump issued. Uh, so that's, that's the one that was being referred to. So I think you answered that in part, but again, you know, what kind of impact do you think that had was essentially the question that was posed as I recall. Yes, I'm sorry. I, I don't know of any specific impact that that has had yet. It, it may have, and I may not be aware of it. Um, so, um, but I'm, I'm not aware of, of anything more than, than what I said in my previous answer, but thanks for clarifying. Okay. Okay. It may be at minimum symbolic and symbolic for a particular audience. Uh, would be my guess, but anyway. Well, listen, we are uh, a little bit of overtime, actually, but let me thank uh, Juliet so much for what I thought was a really interesting, stimulating uh, presentation and response to uh, questions. For those of you who submitted questions that I was not able to get to, I very much apologize. Uh, we just uh, didn't have enough time. But again, I want to thank Juliet, and I want to thank all of you for, uh, for being participants in this event. And uh, on behalf of the Center for Latinos and American Politics Research, uh, I and we wish you all the best, and please stay safe and healthy. And again, thank you, uh, Juliet, and, and everyone yeah. take care. Bye-bye. Uh, thank you.